All right, well, everyone, welcome today uh, to our really uh, wonderful seminar. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Christina Issa. Uh, I should say beforehand, I'm Ken Reardon. I'm uh, the director of the Sustainable Bioenergy Development Center here at CSU and um, also part of the Banner Project itself that's led by Dr. Keith Poston. Uh, as I mentioned, we're fortunate today to have Dr. Christina Issa from the National Renewable Energy Lab today to talk to us about her work in thermochemical conversions of biomass and involving the formation of biochar. Um, Dr. Issa has her degrees in chemical engineering uh, from bachelor's through PhD, all from Finland, and she came here to the U.S. a while ago now, uh, had a number of years where she was working in a research capacity at Georgia Tech, um, and in September 2008 came to Colorado and started working at NREL. And there she's a senior engineer, I believe, and in the biomass molecular sciences group, um, doing some fabulous work in thermochemical conversions, and we're fortunate that she's here today to tell us about some of that work. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here and talk to you about uh, the production of transportation fuels um, and also specifically from mountain pine beetle killed trees uh, via fast pyrolysis. So I, will, so I will be first talking in general about the thermochemical conversion of biomass um, and I'll talk about the U.S. Department of Energy uh, bioenergy technologies uh, goals and the different pathways that they are looking at producing transportation fuels. And then I will talk about our experience on the production of transportation fuels from mountain pine beetle killed wood and some other uh, woody residues at the same time. And the method that we used was pyrolysis followed by hydrotreating. So first, um, I assume that most of you are familiar with what uh, lignocellulosic biomass is, but here is just a brief uh, description. And this biomass that could be used for producing biofuels could be any type. It could be woody, grasses, crop residues, municipal solid waste, or any kind of biomass. And it has been uh, found out that in the U.S. there's over one billion tons per year of sustainably available non-food lignocellulosic biomass uh, available. And if that were all, trans you know, if all of that formed uh, transportation fuels, that could be uh, more than 30 percent of the current uh, petroleum use for that purposes. And we are talking about lignocellulosic biomass because we are talking about biomass that isn't used for food purposes. And so biomass consists of several uh, different fractions. There's cellulose, uh, hemicellulose, uh, and lignin, uh, and then there's some ash extra extractives and other materials. And the next slide shows uh, what these major components look like. So the majority is cellulose, which are these long chains of glucose sugar uh, polymers. And this one usually makes a good uh, feedstock for biochemical uh, transformation. It's easy to have microorganisms that can uh, convert cellulose. Uh, hemicellulose is also a chain, but it, it is a typically a mixture of five and six carbon sugars, and uh, xylose is the most common one of them. Then about 15 to 25 percent of the biomass is lignin, which has these complex aromatic molecules that you see there. There are these aromatic rings that are connected to hydroxyl groups, methoxy groups, um, and these units are linked together usually with uh, you know, oxygen links. And this one, this material, lignin, usually isn't, can't be converted by biochemical methods. But thermochemical methods can 
convert all of the parts of the biomass. And if we look at the different methods of converting biomass, like I already alluded, one can have these biochemical conversions when one usually first, uh, first breaks down the cellulose and hemicellulose to sugars, and then they can be converted to uh, ethanol, or they could be also converted to other compounds. Then there's thermochemical conversion, where the most two uh, common ones are gasification and fast pyrolysis. And of course, there's also combustion if you just burn the biomass and you want to produce heat and electricity. Uh, but if we want to produce transportation fuels or biofuels, um, it's typically via gasification or fast pyrolysis. And in gasification, you um, heat biomass in the presence of not sufficient amount of oxygen to completely convert it and you produce syngas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and then that can be, that mixture can be converted to different types of uh, compounds. Or you could use fast pyrolysis, which means heating uh, the biomass to approximately 500 degrees centigrade in the absence of uh, oxygen, and you can convert the biomass to a liquid. Uh, approximately in 70% yields. And then these, this liquid can further be uh, upgraded to uh, fuels. Uh, there's also different methods for uh, converting algae. And so here's just a little schematic of the thermochemical conversion processes. And as I already said, one, one could convert the biomass to um, a mixture that's rich, rich in carbon monoxide and hydrogen and convert that to liquid fuels. This one example that shows the finished product there on the right, that's from a known process, uh, Fischer-Tropsch synthesis, that has been used from coal uh, for decades in South um, Africa. So it's, it's a known process, but in that case, one converts uh, carbon, coal, to the sink gas. But for biomass, um, it's a similar process. The other one is, and here we can see the, an example of the, of the pyrolysis oil that is produced by the process of fast pyrolysis. And then that one can also be um, upgraded to uh, liquid fuels. So in fast pyrolysis, one has rap rapid heating with heating rates of in excess of 1,000 degrees centigrade per second and to moderate temperatures between 400 and 600 degrees. And then you quickly quench these vapors so that the total vapor residence time at the 500 degrees is about one second. And you can get high liquid yields up to 70% and about the same percentage of the energy in the biomass can also convert it to this, uh, uh, to this liquid pyrolysis oil. This technology is, an, is commercially available to up to maybe 500,000 tons per day, and it's being rapidly commercialized for boiler use for purposes of burning the liquid in uh, for heat and power purposes. And here's, here's an example of uh, full-scale uh, equipment and another one that shows a, a schematic where the reactor on the left is the actual uh, pyrolysis reactor and the rest is for separating the solid residue char and then rapidly quenching the liquid. If we look at the properties of the raw pyrolysis oil, so it has a high water content, up to 30% of the material is water. That includes water that was originally in the biomass, but it also in, includes water that was formed during the pyrolysis reactions. It's quite acidic. It contains uh, acetic acid and some formic acid 
and the pH is about 2.5. And it may be that it's, it's in two phases, but it's not always. Uh, it has a lower heating value of about 16 to 19 megajoules per kilo. It's, it's not miscible with petroleum products. And if you heat it up, then about 50% of that material doesn't revaporize. And if we compare it here to the heavy fuel oil, and so the water content, the pH are clear problems, the high oxygen content, the heating value is about the half or less than that of what heavy fuel oil has. Um, and then there's the problem that you can't distill it. Yes? Is that heating value um, with the water still contained, or is that after the water is separated out? Um, it includes the water. It includes the whole liquid. And it's not really easily possible to separate the water from the, uh, from the pyrolysis oil. And so if one wants to use this liquid for any other purposes except immediately burning it in a special application that can tolerate the acidity, it needs to be upgraded. It needs to be deoxygenated. And uh, I will be talking about uh, an example of pyrolysis and upgrading in the end of the, end of the talk. So the, uh, so the US uh, Department of Energy and the Bioenergy Technology Office has a vision of producing from biomass several different products, producing biofuels. And when they say biofuels, they mean liquid transportation fuels. Uh, and, and different kinds of bioproducts and biopower. And at the same time, enhance energy security, uh, you know, reduce the dependency uh, on oil, you know, provide environmental benefit, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also create, uh, create new jobs. But specifically, what the Bioenergy Technology Office has as a goal is to develop technologies for biofuels that are compatible with the current infrastructure. And by that, they mean that they want to produce liquid transportation fuels that are hydrocarbons. That they want to uh, promote uh, research and development into the production of hydrocarbons from biomass. And they're supporting the goal of the 2007 um, Energy Independence and Security Act, goal of 36 billion gallons <coughs> per year of renewable transportation fuels by 2022. And they also have a you know, specific goal that this should be done at a cost of $3 per gallon. And the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that I work for is, you know, we're part of the Department of Energy. And so we're concentrating on the production of transportation fuels. And the Department of Energy originally looked at 13 different pathways for producing uh, transportation fuels. And out of these 13, eight remain under consideration. And several of them are thermochemical processes. First, there's two, uh, two conversions where you first reduce cellulose and hemicellulose into sugars, and then those sugars could be upgraded to hydrocarbons either uh, biologically or catalytically. And there are two that are related to algae. One is it's possible to produce algae that have a high oil content, and then you know, from that oil, you can uh, upgrade that, uh, those lipids into hydrocarbons. Or the other one is uh, hydrothermal liquefaction of algae. And hydrothermal liquefaction is also a thermochemical process. It's done in an aqueous phase at uh, elevated pressures in the, in the presence of hydrogen and catalyst. Uh, and then uh, you can produce 
produce hydrogenated products um, which may require further upgrading. But the four, four uh, last ones, they're clearly uh, thermochemical. One of them is uh, fast pyrolysis um, and hydroprocessing. Two of them are catalytic fast pyrolysis, and one is via gasification, upgrading the syn gas to hydrocarbon fuels. And I have a, a slide each on the uh, last four ones. And so here is fast pyrolysis followed by hydroprocessing. And in the first step, one needs to grind the biomass to uh, small particles. And this is required in order to get the fast heating rates. If you have large particles of biomass, only the outer shell is heated up rapidly. But in order to, to, get, uh, to form the liquid, you need rapid heating. And so that's why you have to have small particles. Uh, then it's um, rapidly heated to approximately 500 degrees, rapidly quenched. And then the liquid bio-oil is taken to a hydro-treating process. And this is similar to a process that is used in the petroleum industry. In the petroleum industry, you typically want to remove sulfur or nitrogen, but in this case, that is used for removing the oxygen. And it is typically a two-stage process because there's a lot of oxygen, about 40%. And the first step, the mild hydrotreating, is used to stabilize the oil, first to hydrogenate the double bonds so that it doesn't uh, you know, further coke during the, the final heavy hydrotreating. And this is something that is a near-term possibility because uh, pyrolysis itself is being commercialized. Uh, you know, there are commercial units and some have been operating for quite a long time and the hydrotreating is also you know, an, a known process to a certain extent but it's applied to a different um, feedstock and it has its own, own problems. Uh, then the next one is ex situ catalytic pyrolysis and it is a very similar process. You will have the fast pyrolysis, but after the fast pyrolysis, before the vapors are condensed, one adds there a catalyst, which is typically a zeolite and this can be done under you know, atmospheric conditions. And you can partially deoxygenate the oil so that the oil that is then condensed in the, in the next to last step, so that one can be hydrotreated more easily. And so this diagram shows only one stage of hydrotreating. And then there's in situ catalytic pyrolysis which is uh, one where the catalyst that does the, does the vapor phase upgrading is actually added to the same reactor where the pyrolysis is taking, taking place. Uh, and this one will give a lot simpler design than for the ex situ catalytic pyrolysis, and that's also uh, connected with a lot lower capital cost, a lower operating cost. But the problem is that it's a lot more difficult operating conditions for the catalyst. It's not possible to optimize the process separately for pyrolysis and the catalytic upgrading. And, and secondly, the, the pyrolysis reactor has a lot of components that may not be good for the catalyst. There is um, all the ash from the biomass, uh, which may poison the catalyst. So it's, uh, it's uh, <coughs> technically more difficult, uh, but... Uh, potentially more attractive <coughs> than the ex situ catalytic pyrolysis. And the fourth thermochemical process is upgrading of syncas that has been produced by gasification. Um, so upgrading that to hydrocarbon fuels. And in this process, one has higher temperatures than for, than for pyrolysis. The temperatures are around 800 to 900 degrees. Uh, one needs to... Uh, clean and condition the syn gas, the mixture of uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then there are several possible conversion pathways uh, for producing these uh, hydrocarbons. 
And so some of them are also biochemical. So it is possible to ferment the um, synth gas, the CO and hydrogen. So there are these hybrid processes. Uh, one could go and produce methanol, uh, which can be done at you know, very high yields of over 90%, and then convert methanol to, for example, uh, you know, triptane, which is a, which is a carbon that has it's a, it is seven carbons. Or one could produce ethanol and from that uh, produce hydrocarbons. And I earlier mentioned this physotrop synthesis that has been used uh, for coal in South Africa. So that's one that is regarded a known technology. And so uh, you know, the Department of Energy is not putting money into the research on that one. Uh, it's a known technology, but the problem is that it works well in large scales. You can, you can um, easily have very large uh, coal uh, gasification plants. It's a lot more difficult to have biomass because you will have a limited radius, radius from which you can collect your biomass. So something uh, of the order of 2,000 tons per day is typically regarded a, a limit for these biochemical, you know, these uh, conversion plants for biomass, whether they're biochemical or thermochemical. And so, on the second part, I want to talk about the pyrolysis of mountain pine beetle killed wood. And so, this is kind of the first of the four thermochemical pathways uh, that I showed earlier. And this work is part of an international collaboration between the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and CanMet Energy, which is part of the um, Natural Resources Canada. And in this collaboration, what we are doing is uh, trying to advance pyrolysis of residue woody feedstocks uh, for the production of transportation fuels and uh, biopower. And so we're looking at what are the production and upgrading requirements uh, for specifically pyrolysis oils so that they can be used in, in uh, transportation and also for electricity production in stationary power applications. Uh, and Canada is more interested in the electricity production, and it's possible to take this pyrolysis oil and burn it, but uh, unless it's done immediately, there are some changes in the chemical composition and it will still need uh, upgrading. And so for this work that I'm going to show, the, our op objective was to look at uh, the pyrolysis of several different woody resi residues compare the oil yields and oil quality. We made experiments at <coughs> um, two different scales, and we looked at six feedstocks. Uh, two of them were clean woods. Uh, one was the mountain pine beetle killed trees, and then we had three hog fuels, which are residues from, they could be from a sawmill or a pulp mill, but they're residues, in this case, they were from a sawmill. And then we also looked at the upgrading by hydro-treating of the pyrolysis oil of two of these materials. And the mountain pine beetle killed trees was one of the two. And when we were studying pyrolysis, we did experiments at two different scales. Um, and I will have a picture of the e experimental equipment for both scales. So first, there was the micro scale, which comes from that it's a microliter scales, and so we have milligram quantities of biomass that we were studying. Uh, and in that case, we were analyzing the vapors as they were produced during pyrolysis. And this method is really good for rapid screening, screening of feedstocks and operating conditions. And then we did um, experiments at so-called bench scale, which originally meant that it's a scale that you would have on a bench top. 
Sometimes they are a little bit larger than that, uh, but um, it's a scale where one uses uh, about one to two kilos of the biomass. Uh, and then there was a reactor that had an inner diameter of five centimeters. And in that one, actual oils were produced and then we measured the properties of the oils. And here are the feedstocks and in the lower level, the first one here is the, um, the beetle killed pine. That's the reference pine. That's a reference hardwood. And then we had the three hog fuels, which are residues from a sawmill. And those were, one was from an interior, meaning not on, on shore of an ocean. And then there was coastal one, and then there was salt laden, where the, where the, you know, where the logs had actually been transported in the ocean. So they had a lot of, lot of salt. And I'm showing the elemental composition and the ash content of the feedstocks. And so the three clean fuels and the mountain pine beetle kill trees, you know, go into that category. They have, you know, one to two percent of ash, and they have very similar carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen contents. Uh, but the but the hog fuels, the residues have a lot higher uh, ash contents. Uh, actually, the coastal one had the highest ash content, but it had a lot of just uh, like soil and other material with, with, with it um, and maybe, maybe sand. So if we looked at the actual uh, you know, ash and salt content, so the salt laden had higher alkali metal contents. And I'm pointing this out because this will show in the results uh, is, the, uh, is the alkali metal content in the ash. And so in the micro, in the micro scale, uh, we have a situation where we had these, these small sample tubes that could hold maybe um, up to 10 milligrams of biomass. We put there four milligrams of biomass. Uh, and so they were, they were put into an order sampler. And from there, the cups were dropped you know, one at a time into a heated furnace. And it's a very small cup um, and, you know, a quite a high-powered furnace, and so you can, you can get the biomass heated fast. Then the vapors were taken through a heated line into a so-called molecular beam mass spectrometer. And so what happens is that, you know, one skims them so that one forms a molecular beam so that there's a very, um, very low pressure, and then you, you have the, the vapors and you can freeze the composition of the hot vapors. Because if we, when we condense the vapors, there's some, some changes. Uh, and we also use in that one uh, lower, um, you know, lower power than people usually use in mass spectrometers, and so we get a lot of signals for the parent molecules. And here's an example for the, for the signals that one can get for the mountain pine beetle kill tree. And this is the mass divided by the charge. And we can see there are different peaks. Uh, you know, here's 43 and 44. 44 is CO2. 43 is an acetyl group. Uh, and each of these typically uh, refer to different compounds. And we've studied a lot of uh, biomass pyrolysis, and so, uh, like, this one here is a, is a methyl guayacol, this 138. Uh, so all of those, you know, these are, these are some extractives, 285, 239. So, so those peaks correspond to, uh, to different compounds. Sometimes there are several compounds at one, like for example, 60 could be acetic acid, or it could be hydroxyacid aldehyde. And both of them are at quite high concentrations. Uh, I think it's this peak, this peak here. So both of them are at quite high concentrations in, uh, in the pyrolysis vapors. And this is just a picture of the, you know, of the equipment and the actual, actual pyrolyzer is very small, but uh, you know, having the molecular beam mass spectrometer makes it larger. 
And here are some results for those. And uh, we did experiments at two different temperatures, 450 and 600, so that we would take a very low pyrolysis temperature and a very high pyrolysis temperature. And in this case, we were only measuring the vapors. We didn't actually measure the oil. But we used the total ion count from the mass spectrometer minus the, the ion counts for the gas species and used that as a surrogate oil yield. Uh, and so what one can see here is that the, you know, always the higher temperature gave higher, higher yields of, of, the, of the vapors. Uh, and then you can see here is the pine, and here's the mountain pine, beetle killed pine. They gave very similar yields. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the hog fuels gave a lot lower. Uh, birds gave somewhat lower than, than the pine. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have the mass of the residue. Because when you uh, pyrolyze, not all of the biomass becomes, uh, becomes this liquid. About 70% may form the liquid, and then half of the remaining, remaining may remain as char, as the solid residue, and then you know, maybe half of that. 15% goes into gas phase compounds. And so this one just shows uh, the, the result for the char yields, always lower char yields, as would be expected at the higher temperature, and uh, you know, relatively similar for the, for the, for the two pines, uh, and then higher char yields for the, for the hog fuels. And in order to get insight into the composition of the oils, uh, because what we get for each <coughs> test was these, this mass um, spectrogram, which has we, you know, about 300 different peaks, and they all, all varied. So we used a statistical method called multivariate analysis to identify you know, groups of spectral peaks that varied uh, uh, you know, correlated with each other, so that if some of them were high, the other ones were high, uh, and if some of them were low, and so so it um, so it combined them, and when it's done, it typically actually actually forms. We use normally a default value that it it divides it into ten principal components that are each such that they that they go up or down together. Uh, but usually, out of these 10, only one or two or three are important. And I'm going to show the results and, um, and explain a little bit more. So this is a result of the analysis. And what I'm showing here is uh, the score for two of these sets of compounds that are called uh, principal components. And so, the principal component uh, one has had such a score that you know the the ones that were clean woods pine mountain pine beetle killed pine and then um, you know the perch isn't here because the perch was very different because it has a different it has you know different lignin components and so if we would put the perch into the same analysis. The bur, you know, that one would be, you know, the differences would be so so great that that was that was totally overwhelming it. So this one only has the five materials that were all pine based, uh, and so so then you know the clean woods with respect to X, you know, the pine and mountain pine, beetle killed pine were quite similar, but then one had interior and coastal and salt laden hog fuel. That varied, so we could see that the that the principal component one, which is related to the properties of the oil, that it is a function of the increasing ash co ash content and specifically alkali ash content in the char. Then there was something else that separated them, so that the pine coastal hog fuel and salt laden hog fuel behaved behaved kind of similarly. If we look at the y-axis. But the mountain pine 
mountain pine beetle, gilt pine, and the interior hog fuel behave similarly. And then if we look at what those, what those principal components look like, so of the difference between the six, six or in this case actually only five materials, it is um, the principal component one explains 71% of the difference between the different oils. And if we look at here, I have marked some components. So all of the ones that have a high value for this uh, principal component one, so they have you know, high peak 44, high CO2 contents. They produce more CO2. Uh, then uh, they produced little methanol and little of acetyl groups. Um, then some other things is that they had less of lignin monomers. And what that means is that it's an aromatic ring that still has a um, hydroxyl group and a, and a methoxy group. But they had more of the ones where the methoxy groups, groups had been removed. So they actually had more of the, the lignin monomers had reacted more. They had lost their methoxy groups, at least to some extent. Then we could also see peak 50 that we don't normally see, which is a um, methyl chloride. And then, then some other peaks that we don't normally see, and at least some of them, I think, would be chlorinated species that would be rich in the, some of the hog fuels. And so, so the second, the, the y-axis explains about 14% of the, of, the, of the difference between the, the different oils. And looking at these, what we see is that the ones that have a high value, they had more of components that came from, that were sugar fragments and lignin fragments, or sugar derivatives and lignin derivatives. And they had less of the ones that were extractives. So, so they were actually, the differences were because the, the feed materials had, um, some of them had more extractives and some had less. And if when we now go back and look at the, the multivariate analysis, so this PC1 is so that if you have a high value, they produced more CO2. You had more of the phenols and less of methoxy groups. You had more of the chlorinated compounds. And so, so this is what it actually is, that the salt laden and the coastal had most of those, and then you know, it re decreased so that the pine and mountain, you know, mountain pine beetle killed pine, they were kind of the opposite. And if we look at what this happened, so what, what it said is that the ones that had high values for this y-axis, they had less extractives. So the difference between the regular, regular pine and the mountain pine beetle killed pine was that this one had more extractives. And there are, two, there are two possible reasons for that. Is that, you know, one may have had more pine and, you know, more bark and needles. It's possible that the mountain pine beetle killed pine had more bark and needles. But also, you know, I'm not a biologist, but I understand that if a tree is dying, it produces more extractives. And so this is what we could see, that there was a little bit of a difference, but the difference was in the oil, but it was mainly that there was more, more, um, you know, with the regular pine, uh, you know, there was, you know, less of, you know, compounds that were derived from extractives. But there was a, a lot larger variation because of the ash content. Uh, then we made experiments in the fluidized bed reactor, and a fluidized bed means that we have here sand particles, and there is a rapid gas flow that goes through that so that the bed becomes bubbling, so that it looks like the sand is boiling. And so this reactor was about 86 centimeters tall, and it has a five centimeter diameter. And we did uh, pyrolysis in that one, and here is um, a summary of the, of the results. Here's the pine, here's the, here's the mountain pine beetle killed pine, they gave, you know, 
quite similar yields as we could see from the surrogate oil yield in the microscale experiments. Uh, and one can also see, for example, that the, that the hog fuels gave you know, high CO2, as we could see from the multivariate analysis. Um, and, um, and you know, one can see this is, this is the acid content that was quite similar for all of them. Acid content is here measured as a total acid number, which is the milligrams of potassium hydroxide needed to uh, neutralize it. And these are typical numbers for pyrolysis oil. For petroleum products, you, know, you want to have a value that's less than one, hopefully less than 0.1. In, you know, less than 0.1 if you want to use it as a transportation fuel. And if we compare the microscale and the fluidized bed results, so here's like the relative oil yield from the, um, from the, you know, from the vapor count and from the, from the actual oil yield from the fluidized bed measurements, and there's a very good correlation. And here's also the char yield, uh, and the trends are the same, even though one did see a little bit bigger differences in the microscale. But one can easily use the microscale experiments to rapidly identify you know, trends in yields, compare conditions, compare feedstocks, and you get also uh, information on the gas and uh, oil composition without you know, producing any actual oil, just using four milligrams of your material. And in the pen, pen scale text, uh, you can actually collect oil, quantify the yields, and look at the oil properties. Uh, in the final stage, we hydrotreated these oils. And we chose two of the oils, the mountain pine beetle killed wood and the, and the interior hog fuel, which was a reference hog fuel. And we wanted to produce finished transportation fuels with low oxygen, less than 1% oxygen was our goal, and a low acid, you know, less than 0 0.1 in the tan. And this was done in a two-stage hydrotreater. And here are the two stages. This is the first stage that was, that was run at about 170 degrees with a ruthenium catalyst, and a second stage at 400 degrees uh, with a cobalt moly, uh, sulfided cobalt moly catalyst, and everything was done at, an, at a pressure of about 130 uh, bars. And this is, these are just two fixed bed reactors. It's a relatively uh, simple, even though it has a lot of safety precautions if you're operating at uh, over 100 atmospheres of hydrogen. And here are just the results from the from the upgrading, and here are some pictures that were taken at different times, because these were long-term experiments. One of them took 40 hours, uh, and, that, and one of them, uh, we ran out of material at 59 hours. Here at 40 hours, uh, which is typical, there was, there was some fouling of the bed, and it had to be stopped. But here, you know, we continued it until we ran out of oil. And so what we could find that, you know, we were producing oil with low oxygen contents and low um, acid numbers. Uh, here are just the oil yields, and that's also oil density. Uh, pyrolysis oil has a density of over one, but then uh, during the hydrotreating, it becomes similar to petroleum. And here's also... Um, how these numbers changed as a function of time. You know, these are based on um, GCMS analysis. Actually, this is a two-dimensional GC uh, mass spectrometer analysis. And one can see that, you know, with time, the catalyst becomes deactivated, and your hydrocarbons go a little down, and some of your oxygenates go up. And they're mainly the phenolics that go up. And one thing is also important is that you can distill these materials. For uh, pyrolysis oil, about 50% you couldn't, you know, revaporize. But you want something that is 100% um, distillable, and then and that it distills at about the same range as, you know, liquid transportation fuels. 
And here's like how they were, how, the, how these compared so that about, you know, 30 to 40 percent was in the gasoline range, uh, over 50 percent was in the diesel range, and which was actually very good because it's diesel is what we specifically want to, want to make, and then there was some percentage of heavier material. And if we look at the overall yields, and here's these two materials, so uh, I didn't put here a comparison for just the regular wood because we didn't do that in this study, but uh, you know they're kind of similar. So the, so the better wood gave a better yield during pyrolysis, uh, but it gave a lower yield during uh, hydrotreating, and the overall yields were the same. And if we, if we, and from regular pine, we get the same overall yield. So if you remember the results from the multivariate analysis, so the lower grade uh, trees gave, gave more of these phenols and less of the lignin oligomers. So you actually, you know, got a lower yield of oil, but it was better quality in the sense that it was easier to hydrotreat. And in the, in the end, you know, the yields of the finished product, finished low oxygen, low uh, acid product, they were the same. And so overall, you know, thermal chem chemical conversion is a viable op option for converting a wide variety of biomass. And uh, it's possible to produce finished transportation fuels by fast pyrolysis followed by hydrotreating. Um, and we also did this successfully for mountain pine beetle kill trees. And I want to thank my uh, co-authors and the funding from the, from the Department of Energy. Um, and so my co-workers at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory uh, Kanemet Energy, and several of my co-workers at NREL. And uh, if there's time, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure we need the microphone, but I can pass it around. Who would like to ask the first question? Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, between pyrolysis and then the upgrading steps, how, how much coupling there is and, and how, how much optimization there are between those two steps. So for example, if you're doing fast pyrolysis and then hydro-treating versus uh, ex situ catalytic pyrolysis, could you have the same uh, pyrolysis unit and then take the, the bio-oil that's created and go through either of those conversion steps? Or would you optimize your fast pyrolysis, your initial fast pyrolysis step, depending on what you're going to do afterwards? Well, it, it's, it's a good question because, you know, because the different steps will impact, you know, the next, the next step. Uh, if you're going for ex situ uh, catalytic pyrolysis, um, you can, yes, in principle, you can use the same pyrolyzer. But it's an important step to, uh, uh, you know, to optimize the pyrolyzer for having the catalytic pyrolysis as the next step. Because when you change the temperature, you're actually making some changes in the oil. You go to higher temperature, you get uh, more, in the pyrolysis, you get more cracking, more water, uh, you know, better quality oil, but your yield goes, goes down. And then that will impact the next stage. Well, based on our microscale tests, uh, if you're going for catalytic pyrolysis, it's better to go to a little higher temperature. That's what we have seen in the microscale tests. Okay. 
but after catalytic pyrolysis, you still need some additional hydrotreating. Otherwise, your yields are very low. You can go directly to hydrocarbons, but the yields are low. I realize this is a little bit outside of the strategic focus of the group that you're working in, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the potential to use this pyrolysis oil as a feedstock for other chemical products besides transportation fuels. To use it for um, other chemical products, it's actually right now used for, um, pyrolysis is used for producing smoky flavors. A lot of the, <laughs> A lot of the, you know, if you buy something smoked, it's, it's very possible that the smoky flavor comes from, from pyrolysis oil. But I mean, that's, a, that's a, something that's been done for, for a long time. But if you're talking about producing different, uh, uh, different separating different, uh, different components from the pyrolysis oil. So there is a lot of work going on that, um, and people have, for example, because from the lignin part, you get a lot of phenolics. And the phenolics could be used for polymers. So there is, there is work going, um, going for that purposes. And typically, if you want to separate a component, you, you kind of want to separate the, your pyrolysis oil to the lignin free rich, uh, fraction and the carbohydrate rich fraction. But that would, uh, being able to separate some of the valuable components would greatly uh, uh, be beneficial econom economically. Hi, I'm Torben Grumstrup. And uh, if I understand right, the, the reason that uh, pyrolysis is worth studying is that it works better at smaller scales than gasification. Is that, did I understand that correct? Uh, yes, yes, that, that, is, that is often, often correct because there, there can be, you can have very small pyrolysis units, you can even have these field units that you take, uh, you know, a small unit to the field. People are developing those. Can you talk a little bit about why, uh, why, it, why pyrolysis works at that small scale as opposed to uh, gasification? Well, I mean, sure, one can have small case, small scale gasifiers too. Uh, people have used them to um, to power automobiles during the Second World War, uh, so it's it's possible, but. Uh, but I think that for pyrolysis, you can have several different technologies. And if you're talking about, uh, you know, a small one that you can take to the field, it may not be a fluidized bed reactor. It may be an, you know, kind of an auger reactor. Uh, so the other a thing, more, a little more flexibility in the configuration. Yes. I'll ask one question before John gets his second chance. Uh, it was, did you find between the mountain pine beetle and the hog fuel in terms of the, the fouling of the catalyst during the hydro treating was, was the, uh, well, I guess it, maybe it doesn't matter at that point, um, but just thinking of the sort of the generally poorer quality and the higher ash content in the hog fuel, but that sort of comes out in the pyrolysis yield, I suppose, right? Or it yeah. didn't seem to carry over into the, the, the hydro treating of the, the raw oil. No, it did not carry over to the hydro treating of, of the raw oil. And what we did find is that actually the one from the poorer quality ones, they were maybe of a little bit higher quality. They were more easily hydro treated. But that one kind of requires that you make sure that you don't get any of the ash components uh, into the, into the hydro treating, that there is some sort of filtering that you don't get the, you know, get, um, get solid, so many solid particles. But it actually, uh, you know, fouled less, uh, the one from the hog fuel. And 
that, and, and that's really interesting because if you think of feedstock kind of availability and price, then there's a lot of hog fuel that is almost free for the taking, or it's very low cost. Um, whereas, you know, mountain pine beetle could also be low cost, although if it's not been harvested, then you need to go out and harvest it versus the piles of uh, hog fuel that are out at, at various sawmill sites and things like that. Charlie? Yeah, so I was just wondering, in addition to the experimental work that you guys do at NREL, do you or your collaborators at the Pacific Northwest Lab do any modeling work? And if so, what's the status of that? We do modeling work both at NREL and <coughs> PNNL. Um, so we do we do process modeling. Uh, we have a group that does uh, does does process modeling, and then you know, you know, economic modeling. Uh, but but the first part of I mean, if you're talking of you know like like that type of model, Aspen models for the processes. Yes, we do that. And, and so are these processes and those models fairly well developed? You know, if I came in with a given feedstock and said, you know, if I wanted to do fast car relative at such and such temperature, can you predict what's going to come out the other end? Well, I don't think that currently our, you know, process models are capable of doing that. We would like to likely do some of these microscale tests to get some of the parameters. But the process models, you know, they are being um, fine-tuned so that, you know, they now have, uh, you know, a lot of compounds that do present, uh, you know, pyrolysis oil, hydrotreated pyrolysis oil, catalytic pyrolysis oil. No, we don't do commercial scale, but we do have pilot scale. Uh, our pilot equipment is half a ton per day. And that's kind of recorded, you know, sufficient for a pilot scale. Our biochemical pilot is one ton per day, but the thermochemical pilot is half a ton per day. And do you have any pilot scale experiments working with the fast power analysis technology, or? Yes, we do. On just very compared to feedstock and everything else? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do have that. Well, I have four questions. Uh, what, what what is the source of your heating? What how are you heating up your feedstock? And then also, how is the the uh, subsequent um, products quenched? And is the energy that goes into those processes accounted for in the in the uh, in the yield? Yes, those are those are taken into account in the process models. Uh, you know, in uh, you know the yields that I showed. You know, they're not they're not corrected for that. But uh, you know, our process models uh, do take those into account. Um, you know, in the laboratory scale, we just use electrically heated units. But you know, in a large scale pyrolysis unit, what you do is that you take your your char, the solid residue you burn that one, and that produces the energy required for the pyrolysis. So actually, that one doesn't impact the yield because you use the, the pipe product to heat that up. And you actually, I think, produce a little bit more, uh, more so that you can, you can actually have some extra electricity mm -hmm. to be sold. I see. And then what about the, the quenching? Uh, is there... The quenching, uh, in the... In the larger scale units, how the quenching is done is that you take cold pyrolysis oil and you spray that. And that's how you quench that. And if you just have pyrolysis oil, you know, you're not really able to take the uh, energy, uh, utilize that, because uh, you know, it is you know, really messy, it fouls. If you use catalytic pyrolysis, it may be possible, uh, you know, that you take this this vapor and you you may able to condense it and take, you know, use that heat, that heat for uh, some purpose. I see. Okay, I got one more. Go one more. 
Do you have a sense for how the energy available in the feedstock is partitioned among the products? If you're getting a 70% pyrolysis oil product by weight, does that have roughly 70% of the available energy? Um, it has about 60 to 70% of so the energy. Yeah, remains in the char, or then you have you have produced, you know, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which are some of the uh, right. the and gas what, products. Um, what kind of gas yields do you typically see in these processes? Is it just a few percent? The, no, in the in the pyrolysis step, you get you know maybe fifteen percent as gasoil products. You know, they include CO, CO two, uh, methane. A, a little bit of hydrogen, you do get, um, you know, sometimes a little bit of the higher uh, hydrocarbons. If you do catalytic pyrolysis, you do get some olefins that could be used as a, as a chemical feedstock. Okay, and then I was curious, how important is the, the uh, moisture of the feedstock to the process? That is a very good point. Um, no, because um, what you want usually for pyrolysis is that you reduce the moisture content to about 10%. So that's part of the feed preparation. If you have uh, you know, more moisture, you of course need more energy to heat it up, but also then your product has quite a lot of water and it becomes uh, more dilute, uh, you know, lower heating value, and if you have a lot of water there, it actually easily separates into two phases. Sometimes you may want that if you want to look at some different products or if you want to look at different processes for the, for the aqueous phase and then the lignin-rich uh, phase. Now, uh, some of it ends up in the char, and we do always, when we make these experiments, we actually do nitrogen balances. We try to follow the nitrogen, uh, especially in, in, the, in the micro scale. Uh, some of it stays in the char, but some of, the, some of that is, is released also into the gas phase. No, that one would require a, a larger scale process and you would need to produce hydrogen. So one option is to have this dispersed uh, pyrolysis oil production, but then they would go into, you know, into a central facility for hydro treating. You know, that is a process that is really, uh, it's beneficial to have it in large scale. Well, well, yeah, it, you know, when, when you chip it, you know, because wood easily can, you know, when you take it from the field, it can have, have you know, 30%, even 50% even water. But so when you do the pyrolysis, you have these hot gases coming out of there. And so you can use those to, to dry your, your feedstock. So if you know if you drive up Poudre Canyon and you look around North Park, it looks like you know possibly in excess of 50% mortality from the beetle kill. And I wonder, do you have a feel? Uh, is there a, a, a similar uh, epidemic of, of insect uh, invasions in Scandinavia as well? No, they don't. They don't have that. You no. you, you really don't see it. Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe the the thing is that they're Winters are colder, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. you know, and the pine beetles don't. The forests are survive. much more heavily managed as well, so you yes. don't have the <clears throat> situation where a buildup kind of yeah. keeps going on more or less unattended, and then it, it reaches a 
a real upgrade. Yeah, the other real thing is, thing is well, yeah, there's, well, yeah, I'm not sure, but there's, you know, the, the forests are, are much more actively managed in general as opposed to our national forests in, in you know, Colorado, Wyoming, and et cetera. I think, um, let's see, but, but I was going to say that, that right now the, the, the area of, of mountain pine beetle uh, outbreak that is, is, is sort of ongoing now is really up in Canada from British Columbia and, and parts of Alberta and, you know, up into the Yukon. That's, you know, it's, we're, we're kind of, the mountain pine beetle has declined here after all the trees have been killed. We do have a spruce pine, uh, sorry, <coughs> spruce beetle outbreak is kind of the, the next wave that is hitting those higher elevation forests here that we have spruce, but, and, and there's, there's lots of different beetles as, some of us found out last week in Idaho that are chewing on just about every kind of tree you can imagine. Uh, so let's thank uh, Dr. Issa for very <laughs>